So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to preach this morning, and, and, and I, I want to get into this. This morning we're going to be doing communion in just a few minutes uh, at, towards the end of service, and, and I, I want to share with you a little bit about the fellowship of Christ. And I, and I want to talk this morning, if you'll give me just a few minutes, out of Philippians, the third chapter, verses 8 through 11. One of my favorite sections of Scripture, and a, probably one that I quote the most out of, is found in the third chapter of Philippians. In, the, in Philippians, the third chapter, starting in verse 8, it says, yet, yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is, uh, is, a, is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteous which is from God by faith. Verse 10 says, That I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me for the next few minutes, and let's pray right now that God would touch us. I'm going to ask if you would join with me. Pray that God would open your heart, that you would not only hear with your ears, but receive it with your heart. And I'm going to ask you to do that with me this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that, Lord, you would anoint these lips of clay, that I would speak the words that you have placed upon my heart to, to share. I ask you for an anointing. Anoint my physical body and give me strength beyond my own measure. I pray that, God, you would touch, and, God, you would speak through these words, and, God, that you would touch, and the ears would be open to hear, but the hearts would be open to receive. And I pray, God, that you would let the mind and the heart be one in receptiveness, God, of the word that you wish to speak to us. Touch us as only you can, and God will give you all the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul's greatest desire was to have fellowship with Christ. This was not uh, always the case for Paul. Paul wrestled with it, and late in his life, he was, um, uh, it stood up to be a believer and, and, and became, accepted Christ. But, but when Paul was, was younger, he was rebellious. He was, as a matter of fact, he was in the standard of what we would call it. He was uh, from another religion. He was from the Jewish faith, and he thought Christianity was uh, uh, of the devil, if you will. And they fought, and, they, and, they, and he was actually the one who was sent out by the church to persecute the Christians. Take, take them, put them into jail, and many, uh, as a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, you'll see that he was standing there as, the, as Stephen was set apart, and they took stones, and he was holding all the cloaks and garments of those that were throwing the stones to kill Stephen. So Paul didn't start off as this holier than thou. He wasn't raised in the church. He wasn't given the liberty. But Paul wanted later on in his life. Now what really changed? The first thing, go ahead and, and pull those up. The bullet points that I have here, it says his, he was a, pursuing God by religion. He was trying to find God and he wanted to have God. And, and this is where I tell you this. It doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or whether you're Christian. It doesn't matter whether you're Pentecostal doesn't matter whether you're Presbyterian. A lot of people try to find God and they want to find God through the works of religion. By doing the right things, if you will. By making things right. And you will never be saved by doing right. Amen? Now, you need to get this and you need to hear what I'm saying. Because you will, you, it's good that you do right. Don't get me wrong. It's good that you are, you are doing what you know to do and you're doing it right. But here's the problem. If you're trying to get to heaven by doing right, you're wrong. Amen? There's only one way to heaven, and that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you would be saved. And, and, the, and the hardest thing for us to do is to, to proclaim that and stand upon it, because you are saved by faith, not of your works, because if you saved, you have a right to brag about how good you are. Turn to somebody and say, you ain't got no right to brag. Come on, amen? You, you have no right. and you, it, Sometimes we think that we're all that and we're good enough and we have the right to brag because we know this scripture and we can quote this scripture. But I'm going to tell you something. There are people that can quote the entire Bible that's going to split hell wide open because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They know Him, but they don't have Him in their heart. He's not Lord of their life. Amen? 
Surrendering your heart to God means that you put Him as Lord. Lord simply means this. The mannerism of those who direct. That was the Lord. In the, those days, there was a Lord over the manor, and He was the one who directed all that was given. And here's the problem with the church today. We have been told that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. I'm a good person, and I believe in Christ. I go to church on Easter and Christmas. Come on, what more do you want? But He's not Lord of your life. Boy, it's, it's quiet this morning. But if He's not Lord of your life, what you're saying is, I know Him, I believe in Him, I, I, I hear about what He is, but I haven't made Him Lord of my life. When I look at this, then I must understand the pursuit of religion is simply by works. How that I can work myself to be good enough. Paying your tithe and doing all those things. I do the works that I do for Christ because I am saved not to get saved. That's a, that's a quote. What did they say yesterday? It's tweetable. That's tweetable. I don't work to get saved. I do the works because I am saved. Go ahead. Pull the next one up. The pursuit of, uh, to please others. What, basically what uh, Saul was doing, if you will, before he was converted and, and changed his name later to Paul, was the fact that he was trying to please the religious leaders so he could look good in their eyes. Do you know that there are some people that that's what they're all about? Is looking good in the eyes of others instead of seeing how they, they look in the eyes of God? Come on. I like what they, yesterday they were talking about it. They said that sometimes there's people in church and, and you have the camera. That they, the overseer said he used to have a camera that would come down and it would sh shine across the audience. And, and whenever people would be worshiping the Lord, they'd be just singing away. And all of a sudden they'd look up and they'd see the camera was on them and they'd go. <laughs> Some of you get real spiritual when you think somebody else is watching you. But I'm going to tell you something. You better be spiritual because God is always watching. Amen. You need to understand God is looking at you this morning. He knows the attitude that you brought in with you today. Come on. And he knows whether you came today to please him or you came to please somebody else. Amen. And when, you, when it comes down to it, our hearts must be pleasing to him. But, but Saul was trying to please others. He was trying to please the leadership, the religious leaders. He was trying to, to, to if you will, trying to please the good old boys, making them think that he was all that. And so he was pursuing the nature of pleasing others. His desire for self and stuff. Paul said, all the things that I have, all the things that I own, everything that I have got is... And he began to talk about all the things that I had, I count as lost. Nothing. Nothing in your life is more important to you than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Everything else can fall away. But nothing, nothing in this world is important as your relationship with Jesus Christ. Have houses and cars and all the things. Come on, you can have everything you want. You can have it all and still split hell wide open. I know a lot of people that said... If I just had money, I would be the happiest person in the world. I've had others say, if I, was, if I had my health, if I, had, if I didn't have any more pain, I'd be, the hap I'd be the happiest person in the world. Let me share this with you. You're the happiest person in the world because you know Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're healthy, you can still, you can still struggle with your relationship with God. I've seen people that God has healed, and, and the fact is, is once they get healed, they turn around and go right back to the world. They turn right back around where they used to be, where God has brought them from. Lord, I don't know why I'm preaching this way. Other than I can tell you this, you got to look at what changed Paul's life. Because what changed Paul's life is what's going to change your life. In my life. You see, Paul 
quoted this scripture in Philippians when he was writing to the church at Philippi and he began to write these things. He was writing because he had a passion that what happened to him and changed his life and changed all that was about him. And the fact is, is that he had a relationship with Christ. Go ahead and pull that next verse up. You see, Paul, on, if you will, on the road to Damascus, his life was changed. The book of Acts, the ninth chapter, starts off, Paul finishes there. He's going to pursue Christians and he's headed to the, to the city of Damascus to find those Christians, those rotten Christians. And he's going to cast them out and put them into jail. Many of them will be tortured and killed. That's what his plan was. He had a garrison of soldiers with him that traveled with him, and they were on the road to Damascus. But see, God had a different plan. And some of you this morning, you've got to understand, you may have thought that you were just doing your thing and you were going through the... But God has a different plan for you. And it may be on your road right here to Life Church this morning that God said, I'm going to change things in your life. It's time that you realize and recognize God wants to have an encounter with you to change your life. And some of the circumstances that you're going through and some of the situations that you're facing are simply the fact that God is trying to get your attention. You see, on the road to Damascus, Paul, the Bible says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Uh, then he fell to the ground, and, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He began to, to look to Paul when, when he fell down, when Saul fell off, and, and he fell down off his donkey, and he was sitting there, and he saw this light. His life was changed. You heard of the, the, the saying when the, the light came on? You ever had one of those moments when the light comes on in your life? You see, here's what happened to me. I was about 21, 22 years old. And I was living in rebellion. And when I had a wreck, God told me, I spared you for the last time. A light bulb came on. Don, some of us are thicker headed than others. I say that because I know Don. Don. But sometimes, God, we have that moment. And I was sitting there, and I was sitting in my, my parents' living room, and I knew I better make things right with God. And I repented. And I was raised in the church, and I knew church. And I played that game of sitting with, with the, the Christians and playing that game where I was righteous on, in church, but I was living like the devil with my friends. And when I sat in that chair that morning, I made a commitment. And I said, Lord, for, thank you for sparing my life. Now, I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've done some dumb things since then, but I will tell you something. When I made that commitment, God got a hold of my life, and I am not turning back. The most important thing from that day on was my relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything else became second. And you can keep running down this road away from God, or you can realize God is trying to get your attention and turn yourself around and run to God instead of from God. Go ahead. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he used the word Lord. And then the, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the go goads, gourds. And then he goes on and he says, and he, was, and he, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now, here's the thing that happened in, in this next few verses is, is that when Paul woke, stood up, he was told to go into the city. But a unique, unique thing happened. You see, it would have been fine, and Paul probably would have said, boy, that was really tough. But Paul was blinded. Paul was blinded. And he had to be led into the city. And he had to literally be... I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes we have to be impaled by God before we look to God. Sometimes we have to, God has to get our attention so much that we will stop running it our way and start running it His way. Amen? You see, there's a plan and a purpose for God. And He will do everything He can in, in you and in His time that He has with you to bring you back to His purpose and His plan for you. 
And sometimes we, we go our own way so far that God says, it's time to wake up. When I looked at the, the work of God and I began to see what, what God was speaking to Paul here, he began to understand, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and he begins to be guided in, in, into the city. Later on, he is told that a man by the name of Ananias would come and sitting there in the blindness of where he was. And Ananias went his way, the verse, in verse 17, and he entered into the house laying his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me to you that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. The power of the Holy Spirit began to direct and move in his life in such a way. The transformation happened as he was in, encountered Christ on the road to Damascus. And at that point, God got his attention. He spent his time listening and God was speaking to him through this. And he sent a man by the name of Ananias. Now, I, I'm not going to try to preach this whole story of Ananias coming, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a whole lot behind that. Amen. That was a submitted brother because he was Jewish and he was going to go talk to the one who was crucifying the Jews. And he was putting them in jail and he said, you're going to go preach to him. You're going to go tell him my plan for him. And Ananias even argued, talked a little, a little bit with God. He said, God, are you sure that's what you want me to do? But when he went, he began to proclaim the word of God. The power of God fell. And the, the very works of what the enemy, had, the very thing that God had used, began to break loose the scales from his eyes. And he saw and went with the direction of what Christ is saying. Ah. But immediately there fell from his eyes, the Bible says. And so when, when he had received food, he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. The change that happened in his life was the immediate. And he began to preach. Not only did he, he receive all of his sight back. Not only did he, did he have the anointing to preach the word. Not only did the Holy Spirit speak. Not only did the word of God speak to him. But he went out and started preaching. To the very people that he was to persecute. Look what it says in verse 20. And immediately he preached the, 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 preached the Christ in the synagogues. And that he is the son of God. And then all who heard him were amazed and said. Is it this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem? And has come here for the purpose. So that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength. And confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, pro proving that this Jesus is the Christ. It confounds the world when God can take a wretch like me and turn him around and use him to preach the gospel message. Amen. Can stand up and say that Christ... Listen, I don't know where, you, where you've been or what you've done, but there are people that are going to see the change in your life and they're going to sit there with their mouth open and say, how in the world did he do that to you? They know where you were and what you used to be. But what's more impressive is God loves us even though he knew what we used to be and what we were and what we've done. And I'm going to tell you something. The embracing of the fellowship that he had with Christ at that moment was more than anything. The conversion of what Paul faced to have fellowship with Christ was the encounter that he had on Damascus Road. A true experience to change his life. The second part of this message is this. To have fellowship with Christ. Is to open your hearts to Him. You see, there are believers. There are believers that will hear and understand this. They will hear and, and desire and call upon and want the Lord to come. But won't open the door to receive Him. The Bible tells us in Revelation, the third chapter... Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and him with me. You see that terminology right there is the word is, is to fellowship, to come and dine. He's going to come and sit down and, and, and do this. Now, a lot of people have preached this for years, and, and I've heard it preached and when I was younger, that this message was Jesus knocking on the heart's door of the sinner. But that's not what this is, is it, Brother Farr? 
You see, God's knocking on the hearts of believers that are too busy and preoccupied with life in general, preoccupied with everything, with the, watching all TV and all these other things and going on with all the busyness of life and they never have time to open the door and simply have fellowship with God. They're too busy with life to spend the one who gave them life. They're too busy with all the things and the details that go on. You see, if you really want to understand what Jesus was doing in this, He was trying to tell the Laodiceans, I want to have time with you, and I want to minister to you, and I want to give you strength, and I want to have fellowship with you. But you're just too busy. When I was a youth pastor, we did a drama one time. I was trying to refine it, and I couldn't find the details of it, but I remember the gist of how it went. This young girl got up early in the morning and she was at church the Sunday night before and said, she had prayed and she said, when I got home, I, I went to bed and I said, Lord, I, when I wake up, I want to just, I want to get up early and open my heart up to you. And the alarm went off the third time and she woke up. She said, oh my goodness, I'm running late. I got to get going. I, 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 I'll pray with you as soon as I'm done getting ready. I, before I leave, I, I, I'll spend time. I, I'll get my Bible out and I'll, I'll spend time. I'll leave it open. I'll leave it right there. Play goes on where she gets up. She's, oh man, I gotta, I'm, I'm running really late now. Lord, I close my Bible. I'll, I'll pick it up. I'll read it at lunch. Lunch came by and she was too busy. Dinner came by. She got caught up with friends coming over. Through the night, she got ready to go to bed. And she had the Bible and she picked it up. She started to open it. She said, Lord, you know me. I'm just too tired. I don't have time for you today. The Bible closed. The lights went off. It's Jesus knocking at the heart's door of a church that's too busy for him. I think that you ought to, and I, I was told this years ago, I don't know how many of you, how many of you keep a calendar of, uh, and you keep a schedule? Anybody? So if you're busy, you do. I, I make notes and, and I have, I, I take sticky notes and I write them all, over. the problem with it is, is I can't follow all the sticky notes. I used to stick them everywhere and then I would figure out later on, I forgot, it. this was from two days ago. But, but here, here's the thing, and sometimes you get so busy with your schedule that you need to schedule time with God. I, I found that as a pastor, I'm doing, I'm doing the right things, and I'm doing the things that I know to do, and I'm, I'm trying to do right by, by doing all the things that I know. And, and James has been in the office a little bit this week, and he's been, been there working it, and, and literally, he knows. From the time I get here to the time that I leave, I'm busy doing anything but... You see, I, I get up early in the mornings and I, I, I make a point to get up early before I get here. Because I know if I, when I get here, it ain't gonna, I ain't going to have time. I'm running, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm moving refrigerators, I'm, I'm cleaning out the, the rooms, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing... And, and all of the things. And it's important because even, even at the time when I try to make it for God... The old devil just tries to do his best to get into that time. Come on. You get up and you're, oh, I'm just too tired. I don't want, let me just watch the news. I'll just watch the news. Lord, you understand this today. I'll just, I, I, I'll get you tomorrow, God. To the church at Laodicea, this letter was written. The Bible goes on and talks about how the church had been rebellious. It had fallen away from its first love. You see, it's not very long when you start to putting God in the back burners and start losing your time with God that you become lukewarm in your relationship with Him. It is not the focus time when you first met Him. Come on, when you first meet Christ, you're on fire for Him. Nothing in this world. I can tell you something. We, we used to do this all the time. You can, you can tell the ones who have been saved for a long time and the ones that haven't been when you go to a, uh, these, the, the camp services. Because the people that are, that are new and, and, and they've just accepted the Lord, boy, they carry their Bible, they're always reading, they're talking about Him all the time. They got their hand, when they worship, they're lifted, they're proud of it, you know, come on. The rest of us would just...
Come on. I have more Bibles right now than I've ever had in my life. Come on. I, I, have, I have like seven different Bibles on my shelf in there. And the fact is, is the one that I wore out was the one that I had when I first started ministry. Uh, folks, if, if you're not getting what I'm saying, you're not listening. Because it's so easy when, when the Lord looked at it because the, the church at Laodicea had done just what we have done in this country. We have become lukewarm. We have become pleasure-oriented. We have become designed to be pleasing ourselves instead of pleasing God. Our need for fellowship with Him has drifted and we become lukewarm. You see, he said, I wish that you were neither hot nor cold. And the reason that he's saying he's, he's not de degreeing that, but I've, I've shared this before when I preached on this particular topic, but they had the streams that would, would come into the city and they were moving waters and they were cool and they were, were able to drink that water and it was fresh and it was clear. They also had something that, that like Hot Springs, Arkansas has where they literally had pools of hot water and they used it and they would go there for healings a lot of times. And he said that I wish you were hot nor cold. The reason that he didn't want him to be lukewarm is because that's where the viruses and sickness begins to grow. One time I was studying that particular topic of Scripture, and I never will forget it. Some of you probably never heard this story, but I was pastoring at a small church there in Payson, and we had started, and we were meeting in a storefront. And I was busy doing the work to get ready for, for my services, and I had a cup of coffee. And I had drank, and I, I was drinking, at that time I was drinking four or five pots of coffee a day, man. I was drinking coffee all the time. But I liked hot coffee. I didn't like cold coffee. Yeah, I'm just teasing, just kidding. If you like cold coffee, that's your thing, whatever. But I like hot coffee. And so I would get that, and I would, and, but I got busy, and I got sidetracked, and I, and I had left my cup, and it was, uh, it was almost a full cup of coffee, and, and, I, and I had got busy doing other things, and got sidetracked, and so when I went back in the office, Al, I kind of sat down there, and sat behind the desk, and I reached over to take a drink, and just about the time I got it to my mouth, I looked in the cup, and there was a nice little fly that had landed in my coffee. You see, when you become lukewarm, sin sets at your door. When you're on fire for God and you're doing what He called you to do and you're fulfilling your purpose of what you are to be, the anointing of God moving in you, you don't have to worry about it. You become lukewarm and you become stagnant. That's when the enemy creeps in to attack your mind and your heart. When the Bible says, I will spew you out, about that time I had just a little bit of coffee left in my I spewed it out. You know what spewed? It means he spit it out exactly what it was it becomes stagnant and stale it was no good thirdly we realized that the church of Laodicea had come to the place where they had lost they had lost its need for God they had become to the place where they become wealthy they become blessed and they didn't need God. You see, when this country was started, Don, everything about this country was originated for people who were seeking after God they wanted more of God but now that we have been blessed and this nation has become blessed in its stature and the way it is, it is a nation that we have told God, we don't need you anymore. We don't need you in our schools. We don't need you in our life. We don't need all these things. We've arrived. And I tell you this, this nation is being humbled quickly. It is being brought to its knees by the circumstances. We have pushed God out to the point to where now we are calling back and we're saying, God... We need you again. We need you again. Thirdly, I believe that if we're going to have fellowship with God, we have fellowship through our communion. Communion is the product of, of what Jesus had taught. In His own death, He began to portray it through His communion that He had with His disciples. We also see the communion that He has, in, and, and Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. And he tells us that he uh, begins to speak. And I'm going to read these scriptures, but we're going to come back to them in just a few minutes. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant 
in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You see, communion is the word that is oftentimes referred to as fellowship. When you commune with someone, you are fellowshipping with them. You are spending time, you are taking it in. That's why when Jesus was teaching, go ahead, that next scripture in, in John, the sixth chapter, when Jesus was telling his, those around him, he says, it, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. We have fellowship with him. Amen? Now, I want you to understand this because a lot of you have been brought up in a tradition or a religion, if you will, that talks about the idea of your communion being the access to, to that that brings you fellowship. You are reminded of and you are remembering. Jesus in no way, was no way was he promoting cannibalism. That is not, he was not talking about a physical consumption. And so when we talk about taking communion, taking of the wafer and taking of the juice, we are not promoting the fact that these are what brings you to righteousness. But it's a reminder of the work of Christ that he has done for us so that we and have a relationship with Him so that we can see that and receive that from Him. When we take in the wafer and we take the juice, it is a reminder of the work that Christ has done for us. Sometimes when we get so busy, we need to rem be reminded of what He has done and who He is. Sometimes we get so busy with our life that we forget who he is and we need to be reminded Jesus knew of his disciples and talked about that very word he talked to them and told them how was fellowship found the nature of that fellowship Paul had to give up his pursuit of of God through religious endeavors the Laodicean church had to open their hearts to the work of the of the of the, of the Lord knocking on their door the disciples had to come to the consuming Christ in the fellowship and the relationship of taking it in spiritually. When Jesus said, this will, I will not share this any longer with you. I will not partake of this communion dinner. He was simply saying, this, I'm already the dinner. And when he broke that bread and passed it around to his disciples, they received it. Not even aware of what they were talking about. After Paul had given this, that illustration... They begin to understand, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood. This is the new covenant, which is given for you. I want those ushers that are preparing to wait on the congregation, if they would go right now. Roberto, if you'd come to play. This morning, you see, God has already said that He created us to have a relationship with Him. You were created to have fellowship with God. God designed it so that man would have a relationship. We are not forced like any, any other creature. There is no other creature that's created like us. See, we choose whether we're going to have fellowship with God or not. We, we, we have choose that. You make a choice this morning. Whether I'll receive Christ or not. You make a choice whether you're going to open the door of your heart to Him. You make a choice whether you're going to have fellowship with Him or not. That's why one of the things that Paul writes when he says this, he says that when you take communion, when you do this, as often as you do this, you need to understand that there is a statement that follows that. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said, let a person examine himself and see if they're taking this unworthy. Because they haven't opened their door. Because they haven't had the fellowship that they need to have. And they need to be reminded of taking care of those things. So this morning, before these ushers wait on you to give you this, this juice and this wafer. It's, it's grape juice. And it's a small little wafer. 
The wafers might be a little stale. They're a little old. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this. What it represents will change your life. I have never, ever taken communion that it hasn't made of my relationship with Him. When I hold that wafer in my hand, I'm reminded of His body being broken for me. When I hold that juice, I'm reminded of His saving grace, the fulfillment that He came to do, and to thank Him for it. This morning, right now, I want you to be reminded. You see, I believe that some of you, the Lord Jesus is knocking on your heart's door. You've been so busy doing your thing that you haven't had time to spend with Him. Some of you, He's had to slow you down a little bit and say, hey, I want to have fellowship with you. I want, to, I want to spend some time with you. Right now. Right now. With your heads bowed and eyes closed. Perhaps you're, you're, you're one of those that you have been doing the religious work, but you, you, you still haven't committed your life to Christ. Maybe, maybe you're holding on to that, that there'll be another day, there'll be a right time when everything in my life is settled. When everything is right. That's when, I'll, that's when I'll go through this thing. Right now, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I believe some of you could almost literally hear the knocking on your heart's door, the very work of what Christ is doing to communicate with you. Lord, I pray with our heads bowed and our eyes closed that we would look deeply within our hearts. You see, there are two people in this room right now that know where we are with you. First of all, we know that you know all things, so you know where we are with you. But there are those in this room that are under the sound of my voice that they know that they are not living a surrendered life to Christ. And they've been playing games with you, God. They need to make that right right now. I pray, Heavenly Father, with their heads bowed and eyes closed, that they would pray this prayer before they take this communion that they would bow their heads and say Lord forgive me forgive me forgive me of rebelling against you forgive me of not opening my heart up and not spending the time that I need to spend with you forgive me God Lord I give you my heart today I make you Lord of my life today and may nothing nothing hinder my relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as the ushers wait on you and they begin to receive it, if you'll just hold on to it until we've all received it. Ushers, if you would, right now, wait on the congregation as they come. I want you to hold this in your hands. Roberto, I want us to do this as they're passing that out. I want us to just sing a little chorus. It says this, What? can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, right now, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me, the blood that you, that spilled on that day that, God, you hung upon the cross, Lord, I receive it today. The fellowship that I have with you, God, become greater. May it be the greatest desire of my life nothing else to take your place. Hold that right now in your hands as you're as, as the ushers are waiting on you and you, you take that cup in your hands and you hold that wafer in your hands that just 
They're just symbols of what represents so much power. You see, Paul not only said the fellowship of his suffering, but the power of his resurrection. You see, when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave, when, when he rose from the dead, he set those things free which had held us bound. Right now, as you hold that in your hands, I want you to think about it. If there are things in your life right now that are holding you, that are controlling you, that are dictating to you your lifestyle right now, we sang that song, He Has Come to Set Us Free. We, we talk about it all the time, how that He has set us free. And oftentimes we, we ponder the idea of the freedom that we might receive. And right now, as you hold that in your hands, if you've made your heart right with God, if you have made Him Lord of your life, then right now, as you hold that wafer in your hands, right now, it is, it is that symbol that sets you free. This is just a wafer. But as you are reminded again of the work of Christ, you can be reminded of the evident power through the name of Jesus Christ. Right now, there is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. Right now, as you hold that wafer, I want you just to thank him right now for the body of Jesus Christ. I want you to thank him right now. I want you to thank him right now. Come on, if, if you're struggling with it, if you're struggling with, with the, very, the works of the enemy over you right now, I want you to thank him for it in Jesus' name. And then as you're reminded one last time, would you just break that wafer in the middle? Just break it with your fingers. Put it in your mouth, and as you receive it, you're receiving your healing and the work of Christ. Would you just thank him right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We don't do this as a religious work. We do this as a reminder of the work that Christ you did 2,000 years ago. You provided all for us. In the same manner, Jesus took of the cup and said, This is the cup. My blood is the New Testament. My blood is the new covenant. I have given it to you. In the same manner, Jesus said, Take this cup and do this in remembrance of me. The promise of the new covenant. The law being fulfilled. The righteousness coming through the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you take with me now at this? Now would you stand all across this congregation with me right now? Never will forget one service. I was doing communion. I was a young pastor. Didn't have the opportunity to do a lot of... Ne really never had an opportunity to do it much, I don't think, as a, an exhorter. James, I was leading the congregation of a small group of about 10, 12 people. One of the ladies that was in our church took communion. When she took that communion, she took that juice... And she said, Pastor, I don't know what it was. I don't think it was anything you said. I'd, she said, and this this will really make you feel humbled when you're a pastor, Brother Blood. So she said, I don't think anything you said made a difference in me. But the minute that I took that juice, I received the message of Jesus Christ. It changed my life. I don't know about you right now, but I've been changed. I've been changed. If that's you today, would you just lift your hands up right now? All across this building, would you just do that with me right now? Lift your hands up across this place right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you because you are my Redeemer. I thank you that, God, you have saved me. I thank you and I, I, I commit every day, God, to make you Lord of my life. Will you humble my heart? And keep my eyes focused. And Lord, I pray that, that, Lord, if there's anything that would deter me from my focus on you, I pray that you would open my eyes to see it. That I would receive it. Right now, by the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, I am free. Say that with me right now. By the works of Jesus Christ, I am free. 
by the works of Jesus Christ. I am free by the works of Jesus Christ. I am free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right now. Right now. Reach over, take somebody by the hand. We're going to close. We're going to leave in just a few minutes. But as you take that hand, I want you to pray right now. Maybe you're praying for somebody that's been going through a lot this week. Maybe, maybe they need to, to, to the presence of the Lord unite in this place right now. Heavenly Father, every heart and every mind. As we leave this place, God, I pray that you would strengthen each and every one, that, that, that every hand that's held today, God, they would be receiving the encouragement. And I pray that right now, Lord, you would speak to us. Because I believe this week you're going to stand at our heart's door. And you're going to knock. I believe that in this next week you're going to put us into a place to where God, if we don't look to you, you're going to put us on our backside. So we have to look up to you. It's not about me, God. It's about you being glorified in me. Let this fellowship be a reminder of who you are and what you have done. In every life, we pray and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hug somebody's neck before you leave. Tell them you love them in the Lord today. Amen. God bless you.